Well, hello again, it's David Willey for I Gather. It's now our 18th question and answer session. Um, those of you, as I always say, know the format. Uh, those of you who don't, I'm answering questions that people have emailed in or put in the comments or where I think I can answer them. I can't answer all of them, I'm afraid, but, uh, and we're doing that from home at the moment. The Tank Museum, the good news is we are back open. Uh, you can come along to the museum now, pre-book your tickets and have a look at the conditions online before you come. Um, not all the museum, we haven't still opened the archive and library yet and uh, some staff are still on furloughed so it's not, we're not fully there yet but uh, we're getting there. And if you are coming, and thank you those of you who have put comments down, if you are coming um, do let other people know because obviously it's really important to us that we get up and going again and get that income stream which is the other reason why I'm here at home as well doing these I'm trying to flog you bits that help support us as a charity so um, I know most of you who watch this if you've seen it before you understand it if you don't you wonder why this guy is sitting here looking an idiot trying to flog you things while answering questions and it is a beautifully perhaps just a little bit too hot day here in England at the moment and uh, hence I'm sitting in the garden I got up nice and early to try and do this various issues with batteries and everything so it's now about what are we 20 past nine and it's already baking so um, hence uh, I'm trying to keep a little bit out of the sun and uh, those of you who again watch regularly will probably know I have the dog with me so uh, um, Finn the dog joins in at different times but you know all that most of you so let's get on with the questions so questions so far that we've had in um, Mark and Joan who came down, I hope you did enjoy your visit, um, thank you very much for, uh, well, you, thank you. Um, Rich84 has made comment that the Type 74 is coming out of service with the Japanese Defence Forces. Now any of you happen to watching here, good contacts in Japan, we can go via the Embassy in London, but uh, we haven't really got a modern Japanese tank so it would be quite nice to perhaps try and ask that but I do know the Japanese have major issues about import exporting um, military equipment um, but uh, that's one of those ones we'd probably quite like to follow up on. Um, Devon I hope your Tiger model makes it to you in the end so I know you're, um, it's, it's taken a while but thank you for the other people who've commented about you know finding the models and books and whatever they've been buying getting there nice and quickly sort of thing where you are around the world keep having a go as I keep saying go back have a look at the postage. Um, Daniel Ortiz asks a question which is one that comes up time and time again and I think it's probably worth our while having a little delve into ground attack in the Second World War from aircraft so close air support as it was often called was it really as effective as has been indicated and what really was that effect because I remember I had to um, we were consultants on a book on tanks and the artist had drawn this pictures of a tiger tank and he'd done it that the typhoon attacking it had bounced its rockets down the road to blow up under the belly of the tiger tank and you know when questioned he sort of said oh I'd read that somewhere and there's one end of those sorts of myths about how we were attacking ground targets, especially armour in Normandy, etc. And another end, you know, which sort of says, oh, it was a complete waste of time. They, were, they couldn't hit a barn door, you know, whatever. Um, and a, that spectrum in between, you know, somewhere, where's the truth and all of this. Now, the good news is there's a lot of evidence because of a number of operational research surveys that were carried out during the war as the war went on to try and get to the bottom of what was really being effective, what worked, um, you know, what was the, the, the outcome of all this expenditure, all these men's lives, all these different things going on that, that were making up 21st Army Group, the Tactical Air Force, etc. And uh, be, from that, a chap who, um, if you're really interested in this subject, um, Ian Goodison wrote a book called Air Power at the Battlefront. For air, close allied air support in Europe, 43 to 45. Now he gives an interesting history about how ground air cooperation, certainly in the RAF, wasn't particularly good before the, first, the Second World War. And like with all these things, you know, it got to be good in the First World War with the Royal Flying Corps, lost its way in the interwar period, as it were, and then had to be relearned um, in the Second World War. But um, one of the things that Ian Goodison has done is gone through those operational surveys and put down again what the men on the ground were actually finding so again with places like the Falaise Pocket, the Battle at Mortain etc counting out 
up the knocked out German armour and the abandoned German armour and realising that actually the idea it was a claim from a hit from a typhoon etc was just not always going to be the case in that way and one of the things they did to actually try and demonstrate how accurate a typhoon could be they actually got a captured panther painted it white put it in a field in normandy and as a demonstration and this was in front of some of you know the the, the big names um rocket firing typhoons um i think it's two squadrons of them come over and ultimately 64 rockets are fired at this panther tank from 3000 and 2500 feet um, the target was clearly indicated, so as I said, it was painted white. Uh, there was no fire coming back, so there wasn't, they weren't having to avoid anything, as it were. And, um, and these are those famous 60-pound, three-inch rockets you see on the end. We, I think we've got one at the museum somewhere um, that were very devastating if they did hit your tank. Now, it turns out that on those of the 64 rockets fired, on the first shoot of 32 rockets, only one hit the target, and that was on the engine deck at the rear. On the second shoot, there was two technical hits, as it were. One hit the barrel, didn't really do much, but uh, and the other one was a decisive hit on the uh, on the turret. So, really, what you're looking at there, in, in essence, is those 64 rounds in a plain daylight, good visibility, etc., etc. Only three actually hit the target. And they also looked at the Panther and realised there's no benefit from a near miss. In other words, the splinters were not doing any serious damage to the tank. So again, let's sort of wind back a bit, you know, that idea of how many were being knocked out by typhoons, by close air support, etc. the number of tanks, you know, that gives an indication this was not an easy thing to do. But it doesn't, or it shouldn't, lead us to the conclusion that therefore that tactical air force, those typhoons, were pretty much a waste of time or something. Because what they are picking out is that it is doing enormous damage to the soft skin vehicles because of that blast effect, even if they haven't, haven't hit it directly. And the soft skin vehicles, of course, are carrying all the logistics, petrol, fuel, ammunition, all those other bits and pieces that are going to be essential to keep that armoured force going. And one of the crucial things that comes out from the operational surveys as well is the psychological impact of the air power and the threat it seems to hold for the tank crews. And again, this has happened throughout the 20th century into the 21st century. You know, this idea of the threat of air power is quite often more um, sort of threatening than the actual effect it can sometimes have. And uh, what they actually found, that the Operational Research Survey guys found about 30% um, of the tanks that were at Mortain, uh, that would be left afterwards, were in perfectly good order, but had just been abandoned by their crews because their crews could not cope with the fact of being under that sort of close air attack. And again, I'll just read this. This actually comes from uh, Ian Goodison's book. And he talks here about, um, I'll, I'll read what he says. This was an important discovery at the time in a contemporary RAF tactical survey stressing the demor demoralizing effect of the three inch rocket projectile, or RP as it was generally called, offered this explanation for the German abandonment of tanks and vehicles at Mortain. Interrogation of prisoners has shown without question that German tank crews were extremely frightened of attacks by RP. Crews are very aware that if an RP does hit a tank, their chance of survival is small. It is admitted that the chances of a direct hit are slight. Nevertheless, this would hardly be appreciated by a crew whose first thought would be of the disastrous results of a hit if a hit was obtained. Uh, it goes on, he says, Ian says, um, prisoners of war data further confirm the demoralizing effect of the air attack upon tank crews. German tank crewmen questioned for a later joint RAF British Army study of typhoon effectiveness indicated an irrational compulsion among inexperienced men to leave the relative safety of their tank and seek alternative cover during air attack. Quote, the experienced crew stated that when attacked from the air, they remained in their tanks, which had no more than a superficial damage, cannon strikes or near misses from bombs. They had great difficulty in preventing the inexperienced men from bailing out when aircraft attacked. So again, back to, you know, this idea of does the ground attack really do what we think it does? 
Um, it turns out that they, they, they statistically found that um, the Hurricane 2Ds that were firing these 40 millimeter cannons out in North Africa, they were tremendously accurate, fry, were frightening the life out, probably more, much more accurate in terms of target hitting than the Typhoons with the rockets later. But because these 40 millimeter Vickers cannons they were carrying slowed them down, those squadrons, and only two of them existed, had higher losses so in the end, they, those, they were abandoned. They didn't actually go any further than North Africa, even though they were very effective and very accurate. Um, so again, psychological impact, you just have to think that one through, that, that idea of the potential impact of the air power leads crews to abandon the vehicles. The actual chances of the Typhoon doing an accurate hit on German armour is still pretty thin, but that doesn't mean to say their attacks therefore were ineffective. Um, and you know, we always talk about the Normandy one where again, then there's, um, so there's close air support, but then there's medium bombers doing their bit as well and things like, again, coming back to the Germans may have had their tanks and armour there ready, but if they're being bombed in the, on the Loire Valley, the Seine River, there's one point where only one bridge across the Loire is, is still working for the Germans, so they're having to take all their ammunition round to get it through that way. And there's a day in the Normandy campaign where they actually run out of 88 millimeter ammunition. That's how effective that tactical air force work and medium bombers, etc., were being on starving the battlefront. Um, you know, and again, all the you know, you, you read all the stories as well about that again, that impact of how it curtails German movement in daylight hours because of the threat of sometimes close air support, sometimes medium bombers having a go. So um, anyway, I hope that one kind of sort of answers a little bit that um, question. It always comes round and again, you're, you know, at one point when I was explaining this some years ago, this guy got really affronted as if we were somehow having a go at the Typhoon pilots. Nothing to do with that at all. Brave men exactly doing their job, but with the, probably the same result as if they'd been accurate as it were. Um, but the accuracy, that's not their fault or anything. It's that accuracy is not what perhaps we've subsequently been led to believe. Um, right, so that's that one. Um, I did have a look, that Ian Goodison book is around still, if you look on Amazon and some of the old book sites. Um, it's not that cheap, but again, it's, it's a book you really need if you're interested in that topic area. Um, Christopher Stewart asks the questions, were there any British tanks the Germans were impressed with? Um, and your partner, I gather, watches because of Finn, the dog. Um, so, hello, partner. And uh, yes, the Germans were. There's, um, I, I should have dug it out beforehand, but there's a couple of really good accounts of when the Germans are first turning up in North Africa, they're meeting Matilda II's, Valentine's. Um, they are assessing of those because at the time, the Germans have only got the Panzer III um, hasn't got its long barrel 50 millimeter gun on necessarily yet, you know, so, so they are actually seeing those tanks as being more heavily armored than their own and being effective with a two pounder gun on. Um, so yes, there is a point where that happens. As the war progresses, you know, like, like with all these things, there's, there's times where the nature of the engagements in North Africa, that assessment of the enemy, that sort of almost personal dual type thing, um, there's other parts of the campaigns where what's the other side of the hedge or what you're firing at becomes kind of less important in a sort of one against one scenario with, with the desert because of the nature of you know nothing else around. Um, quite often that, that sense of knowing the capability of your enemy becomes even more important. Um, but again, you know, and again, back to that, just a general point of the question, Albert Speer, you know, I mentioned it in an earlier tank chat, he's quoted as saying, when they look at the Sherman, these are better than our tanks, he was saying. And, uh, and you're back to as well, what does it mean? Um, you know, you can be impressed by something, etc. Is it the better one? And you're back to this qualitative decisions on things. Um, actually, when we think about it, you know, obviously I would argue the Sherman was a very clever American design. One against one against the best German tanks, of course, it's not good, but there was always that supply chain that was providing all those Shermans. So it was a completely different ball game, quantity against quality. Um, Rees Fugacre, Four Acre? Um, Ask the question, were machine guns used to attack other tanks? Um, and yes, because basically very early on, a lot of the campaigns early with tanks were only armed with machine guns. So that again, Spanish Civil War, interwar period, etc. A lot of those engagements are only with machine gun armed tanks. So that goes on. But what you really meant to ask me was, um, I'm sure you meant to ask me, didn't you? 
boys, did anyone ever attack a tank with a pistol? Because I just love this. I want to read this to you. Um, which is from the Royal Tank Regiment, George Forty's nice um, pictorial history. Um, this is about uh, an attack in North Africa. Um, and uh, this is what you can do with a little bit of oomph, okay? Read this one, so I'll read this one to you. My recollections of Bida Form start with a 36 hour run across a desert area. The terrain we crossed to cut off the Italians was terribly rocky. As we approached Beda Form, for my, com my commander, Lieutenant Norman Plow, told me to shoot up an enemy staff car. But the range was too great and the tank was bouncing about all over the place. Whether I hit it or not, I don't know. But some of my tracers certainly surrounded it. We then joined the rest of the squadron. It was quite dark now and after some time, my commander told me that we had to go out to spike some deserted enemy guns. This was going to be my job. We mounted and advanced along the convoy of enemy trucks. We then got to the end and saw two Italian M13 tanks stationary and we approached them from the side until we were about 15 yards away. The operator, Tafuse, was then ordered to get the crews out. I offered to set them up with my two-pounder, but Lieutenant Plough rejected this because the flash would have shown up our position. Trippy Hughes, a miner's son, then in his early 20s, takes up the story. I crawled up past them and got behind them. The first thing I did was to try a handle on the side of the first tank. I tugged on it, but I couldn't move it. Later I learned it was a revolver port. I went around the back of the tank and over the top. It was still firing. I tapped my revolver on the cupola of the tank. The officer heard it. He shot up and as he came up, he was right at the end of the barrel of my revolver and he never stopped, he just shot out. I took his gun off him and motioned him to stand away. Another two popped up. They couldn't understand why their commander had left, you see. I got them all up then, one at a time. They were frightened and I thought I'll try this with the next one. They were still firing. I did exactly the same thing and got away with it. I had a bit of trouble getting the driver out. He took a bit of coaxing, but he knew what I meant. My gunner was supposed to give me covering fire, but he was firing over my head. He was frightening them to death. I marched them down this piece of road back towards our tanks. On the road, there was this big naval gun which had been mounted on wheels. I was marching them past there, and there was an Italian officer in a beautiful powder blue uniform with gold braid everywhere. I said to him, fall in and there were some objections from him, but I made him march back with his hands on his head as well. My tank commander saw me coming back and I was loaded with their guns and bars of Nestle's chocolate that they had given them, and they had given them to me, uh, and they were on about their bambinos and whatnot. The message went back to my colonel and then to the brigadier. These two tanks were a new type and we had never captured any of them before. The following morning we destroyed that column and we wrecked 80 of their tanks with about 20 of ours and he actually gets a DCM medal for that, but I just thought um, another angle of how tanks get uh, knocked out in battle that sometimes we don't ever um, sort of take on board or think about that much. You all right down there, dog? A bit hot for thin as well, isn't it? There we go. Right, um, right, let's carry on, find some more questions. Uh, Sim Crawford, um, I would be very careful about this. Thank you so much, Sim, for buying things, but do not buy stuff from our shop when you're drunk. Um, so just, again, think think carefully, you know, do it soberly. Well done for buying from our online shop, but uh, I can't recommend doing it when you're drunk. Um, the Quiet Craftsman. Did the Americans call the Sherman the Sherman in World War II? This is this other interesting question, because in Britain, of course, we name the Sherman or the American tanks after American Civil War generals did the Americans. Now they do ultimately absorb that into their system, but finding contemporary accounts of American soldiers calling a tank the Sherman, like get those Shermans over here, is more likely to be get those M4s over here. Um, I've started having a quick look. I think there is evidence of them calling the Sherman, but that's one I'd throw out to you guys out there. You might, uh, and ladies, you might want to have a look and see where you can find it, because it's again, we always call them Shermans, don't we? That name is now stuck. Um, it was a British um, name in the Second World War and how much of that had integrated into the American system uh, and the language of the troops before the end of the war is another one that's a bit harder to judge but you'll probably be able to have a look and find nice quotes out there. But otherwise what were they calling them? Were they calling them M4s etc? Um, which touches on something else. You see when you've got an M4 is it a Sherman 
or is it something else that could be an M4 Model 4 in a different run? So the example is, here's a nice model I was going to show you a little bit later on, absolutely cracking, 116 scale. This M5A1, um, so we called those General Stewarts, um, the light tanks, that one, the first model was the M3, and they were going to, the next model Sherman was going, uh, Stuart was going to be the M4, obviously, as they were going through the models. But they jumped the M4 and went straight to the M5 because they thought it would be too confusing for the troops to have a light tank and a medium tank, both heavily in service, both being called the M4. So they jumped, so this becomes an M5 um, when it goes into service, so they avoid that confusion. So, um, again, you can you know, have a look, come back to us if you, if you find nice examples where they are actually calling the tanks um, Shermans in the actual war. Um, Michael Fuller asked a question, any interesting finds in vehicles when we've restored things? Um, I think, yes, we, we, we've certainly in my time, we've found some interesting stuff, ammunition, small arms. Um, I know the Americans, when they were going to restore a Panther at one point, they opened those floor plates and suddenly there was the ammunition, the main gun ammunition that had been left in the Second World War. Um, one of the things that sometimes comes up is, you know, these little sort of what's been left in that cubby hole because no one's actually opened this box or it's rusted solid for ages and everything. So what's actually in there? Um, with us in the museum, it's always interesting where, because they've been in the museum for way longer than their ever service life was, um, you know, so, so it's what the public have done to those tanks. So they've been posting their sweet wrappers through the engine louvers and, you know, you find old, old coins and all sorts of bits and pieces that have got nothing to do with its war service. One of the things I know the workshop guys do find, you know, is occasionally you'll find that big gunky layer of grease with a spanner stuck in it. And it's very hard, you know, it could be a wartime dated spanner, but they were being used, you know, for a yonk later. Has it sat there all that time since the poor guy lost it or dropped it in the engine bay, you know, decades before or was it a little bit more recent? That's very hard for us to tell sometimes. Um, one of the interesting ones, it wasn't actually a tank, but when we were looking at these uniforms one time, we just were checking through the uh, pockets of this smock and uh, in one pocket out came this crusty, solid um, field dressing soaked in blood, you know, and it had gone all hard and everything, which uh, of course is with bodily fluids and all that sort of stuff nowadays, you have to be so much careful. But um, what, you know, how that had ended up in there in the sense of all these years, you know, and everything else. So, uh, so yes, we do find interesting stuff, but um, yeah. And we try and save that, of course, if we do find interesting things, you know, there's, um, we've got a lovely First World War corn beef tin that was found in one of the First World War tanks that slightly rusted through and everything looks a bit odd, but that was still in the, t in the tank. Um, right, what else we got here? Just Ian asks, um, the cavalry never commissioned from the ranks, um, but the RTR do. How, what's the sort of numbers? Um, well, I just don't think you're actually right there. The cavalry do commission from the ranks, and the head of the British Army in the First World War, um, Robertson, he started life as a cavalry trooper and became got to the right to the top. So it does go on. Um, I think you have to be careful about that sort of like, you know, mythologising too much of the cavalry always being, you've got to be some sort of aristocrat or landed gentry, etc. Um, but I couldn't find, in the time I was looking this morning, I couldn't find any actual uh, stats for you about how many um, came through the ranks. But First World War and Second World War, just a sheer need um, for officers because they were being got through at such a rate, you know, meant that it became much more egalitarian than perhaps uh, it was in times of peace. Um, Doug, Doug JB um, brings up the very important topic of beer and the war. Um, talking about anything about beer, he says, well, okay, let's talk a little bit about beer and the war. Um, India Pale Ale, IPA, was made mainly for the troops in Britain. It was made strong because it had to last, it had to go 11,000 miles around the world to India from Britain, IPA, India Pale Ale. That's um, what we still drink around the place today. That's because of the army out in India. And uh, in the First World War, the whole story of booze, food, alcohol, um, licensing now, you know, there's a, there's a massive topic there because basically what happens is Lloyd George is so worried that British factory workers are putting themselves at risk by getting drunk, they're drinking too much. Um, 
beer before the First World War has a much higher specific gravity than it did later. So in other words, it's much more potent, much more alcoholic. Um, and Lloyd George then brings in the licensing hours that then sort of blight Britain for the rest of the century in the sense of, you know, whenever you wanted a drink, the pub was never seemed to be open or it had weird hours and all sorts of funny bits and pieces. Um, 37 million barrels of beer are drunk in Britain in 1913. By 1919, only 19 million barrels are being drunk in Britain. Um, so it does go down during the war years. And Lloyd George, of course, is teetotal. Um, so he's sort of not too bothered about the fact that alcohol becomes less of a problem. There's another whole story about how um, men were given rum rations, officers with a whiskey bottle, or how you got alcohol during the at the front line and how you know that totter run before an attack etc that whatever you want to call it dutch courage a little bit of oomph um you know and there's there's lots of different stories how medals have been won by people that we probably nowadays call them you know technically they were drunk at the time um so giving courage helping people to cope with the stress you know a huge subject area about alcohol and war and of course in the modern era you might call because you know we find alcohol seemingly acceptable nowadays it will be you know drugs and everything else you know what keeps people going and doing things that way but um the one i was uh, i was interested looking at that because in the second world war as well um again production of beer it, it kind of does go up but um the breweries are already being affected by you know what their access to foreign barley all sorts of things going on that way in britain in the first and second world war the actual strength of beer goes down so its alcoholic content tends to be weaker at the end and there's a point which nearly made me fall off my chair in uh, um in amazement having drunk some american beer and wondered why i was bothering actually american beer in world war ii that was being imported some of it was actually being stronger than british beer which was quite um quite an interesting phenomenon sort of thing going on that way um, there was a committee formed in 1942 called beer for the troops and some of the brewers you know supporting the lads but also not bad publicity were doing things like 500 cases of beer was sent out to the defenders of trabuk and that was done as a bit of a thank you and a pat on the back and lots of publicity was made about that sort of thing. Um, so um, when you've got the opportunity, when you come to the museum, have a look at our new World War II display and Jake Wardrop, I've mentioned him already, does this wonderful diary and he there talks about how they're squirrelling away beer um, for a session because it's all very well being issued with one bottle or you know something else that way. What's the point? Let's wait till we've got enough booze together. And again, he goes on at length about the horror of the fact they managed to abandon one tank, they're under fire. And the biggest tragedy of all was a bottle of whiskey broke in the, um, in the, in the process, you know, and that, that sense of loss that this blooming whiskey had been missing. Um, right, so that's uh, something about beer. Let's carry on a little bit. Um, AJK asked a question, let me have a slurp of my, sorry, am I getting cold coffee here? Am I nice, by the way? Still available. Um, I love tanks mug from the Tank Museum. Mm. stone cold so I should of course have been putting it in my I guess you're all thinking this is a canister round or something no there you go it's a uh, flask like a if you're a shooter like a 12 ball cartridge or similar or say what ball that is that's 75 mil or something rather so anyway there you go so if you fancy getting one of those from the shop that's one of those flasks um, so you don't get cold coffee like I've just had um, so what was I talking about? Yeah, the ergonomics of the Firefly. So what do we want to talk about the Firefly? Um, the Firefly, um, we often use this as a kind of, for modern soldiers and innovation. Um, one of the things that uh, I think it shows is what you can do if you are at, in a push. And the idea was, we know the story, the Ministry of Supply said the 17 pound of this fantastically effective new anti-tank gun, especially when firing disguising Sabo, um, has great penetration. We can't get it on the Sherman. We're not too sure. We're gonna build the A30 Challenger, great big slab-sided thing, try and get the gun in there. Um, but it won't fit on a Sherman tank. And the Witheridge, another chap at the gunnery school down at Lulworth, they then go to Chertsey, have this idea, let's see if we can do it and basically get a Sherman tank and make it up as they go along. So the 17 pounders recoil is so great 
that it will smash the radio. They can't buffer it enough to stop it getting that far back. So what do they do? They take the radio out, they weld a box on the back of the Firefly and put the radio in there. So it's now got enough room to recoil. Um, they, the ammunition is too big for the normal turret stowage. Get rid of the co-driver's position, we'll put the ammunition down there. Um, simple, you know, what's the problem? This is how we're gonna face up to it. It is a bodge, but it is a bodge that works superbly. The ergonomics inside are a disaster in the sense of that 17 pounder barrel coming all the way back and the recoil amount of it really separates the turret. You haven't got that space at the rear there as you would have had to go around in a normal 75 millimeter or 76 millimeter gun Sherman. Um, you've lost your co-driver, so you're now down to a crew of four and that means extra stresses on the crews, you know, in terms of maintenance and everything. But by D-Day, one in three on average of the British Commonwealth forces going ashore, their Shermans are a firefly and that has that hitting power. So that bodge um, ends up working, but it is not the tank inside that was originally designed. It's not a well laid out spacious, as many people called the Sherman. Um, and again, that's all very relative, as you can understand. Um, so it's... It's one of those ones that, um, yes, but think about it, it's bound to be a bodge, isn't it? Um, you know, when you're squeezing something that wasn't designed for that vehicle in there, um, and this is a big gun, the 17 pounder, when you look at it, and there was the other issues, which again, if you read some of the accounts, they quite often had, um, um, they quite often had backflash. So in other words, the powder hadn't finished burning off before on the recoil, the breach is triggered to open. So sometimes you'll get a backflash. So again, part of their firing orders is when they're firing, firing now, and then everyone closes their eyes just so that you don't potentially get a backflash on your eyeball, um, which, but otherwise they just might you know, singe a bit of your hair around the edges. And there's all the old lines about, you know, the fire fry clues didn't have any hair below the beret line because quite often that flash would have taken it off. Um, if, um, if you're unfortunate enough for one happens that way. Um, so again, you know, Firefly was an improvisation um, and no two ways about it, the ergonomics inside it were pretty poor, but it works. Um, what have we got? Winnie J1, bought books from our guys and then broke my knee. I hope you're not indicating there's some connection between your breaking your knee and buying the books, but um, I hope the books are a consolation for you. Um, Bill D in Iowa, Bill D in Iowa, um, he says, when we fire, when you fire a round out the gun or you put the wrong round in, so you've got smoke in and actually now we need our AP, do you have to fire it off or can you open it? Most tank guns, slight differences here and there, most tank guns will allow you to open the breech and there's either a tool or there's a trigger mechanism which actually springs it back so that you can then remove that round and put in the round you do want. You don't have to fire it off all the time. There's a whole different procedure as if you try to fire a round and it's a misfire, how long you're supposed to leave it, if you're under combat situations, what are the issues that way? Um, because again, that's another one of these things, you know, is it actually just a misfire that's slow burning and it will go off and the last thing you want to be doing is opening a breach and then have the, uh, the, 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 the round go off. Um, but most tanks, actually, if you look at their procedures, they'll give you an opportunity to be able to remove the round and replace it with a different type if you need that. Um, Gary Nelson asked the um, point about the pointy front on the latest Leopard tanks on Leopard 2A5, is it 6, 7? Um, isn't that creating a shot trap? Um, what's actually going on there? There's a gap in the armour. So you've done this, the idea being that the air volume and I won't go into the physics of this because I don't understand the physics of it but the volume space in there as long as it's long enough to have the whole length of the long red penetrator when it penetrates through that V at the front it will go through but the air gap causes um, a lessening effect of the penetration when it then gets to the main armour so it's really there to stop it's almost like a false front um, that's going on there so the idea of it maybe bouncing rounds down, it might do that with light caliber, but if we're talking about, don't think of it as being the solid piece of armor that might actually deflect around downwards. This is actually there as a, um, as a special type of spaced armor, not as something that's going to deflect things down because actually the, um, it's there to stop fin rounds and the fin round will penetrate it, or it's there to help stop the fin rounds and it's only when it's got into that space will actually its effect be um, starting to fully work. 
Um, so the idea of something actually at the end of its trajectory or something other just happens to bounce down, that's a, you know, that's a, a random chance, but it certainly isn't going to be solid enough to actually deflect rounds downwards of the type of thing it's designed to actually stop. So I hope that answers that one. Um, Otto Weston, um, I think someone's already answered online, you know, you saw that gun carrier, the Churchill 3-inch gun carrier in our kind of at the side of the car park at work, you know, what, what, what happened to it, what's its story? All the damage on it, no gun carriers went into action, all the damage on it is when it was a range target, so it's been fired at by goodness knows what over time, hence all those little, you know, whether they're law, light anti-tank weapon ones, hollow charge things, etc. That's why it's peppered in the way it is. It, um, you know, it's not it's got some great dramatic story behind it, I'm afraid, on that one. Um, I've missed one because I did get out. Here we go. Tra 779 said, what did the Germans um, think of the Churchill captured at Dieppe? Now, I, again, was having a run around. I can't find, I know there's a whole load of photos, aren't there? A set Dietrich climbing over some of those captured Churchills. I think I've seen reports somewhere of them. So if I do come across that, I'll come back to you on that one. But I did think, I just out of interest, I found... Um, touching on that Boyd Panda issue and thank you for everybody bringing up the fact that I completely failed to mention North Africa where actually of course uh, Britain and Commonwealth forces we did use a lot of captured Italian tanks at one point or intended to even if they didn't always get into action so that was an area I kind of forgot about there and also thank you if we consider Europe those of you who are talking about the M3 grant um, do we consider Russia Europe because of course the Americans did supply M3 grants to uh, Russia so if you look at it that way, yes, the tank does see service in Europe if you think of the Eastern Front as being European. So um, happy to be corrected on these things. Um, but anyway, the, what I did find was um, there's a reference to a German report what happened to some of those Churchill tanks. And surprisingly, but it kind of backs my point that I said earlier, they do actually issue them as part of a German um, tank unit. Two of the Churchill um, threes were repaired and used by Panzerkamp Company 81 and later, later incorporated into Panzer Regiment 100. Um, one operational Churchill 3 was reported on the 24th of March 1943. Both Churchills were last reported uh, on the 1st of December 43. So my gut feeling is, is when they start breaking down, they're not much use because again, the supply of spare parts to keep them going as an active tank unit what again you'll also see is then that repurposing, whether it's scrap metal back to make uh, into munitions or turret systems used as static defences some places as well. Um, but anyway, that, that, that was an interesting case there, which, which making the point, you know, that, that yes, the Germans would use stuff, but it, the vast majority, as I said last time, the Boiter Panzers are the ones where they've got access to the factories so they can make spare parts and keep the things going. Um, Otto Weston, no, I've mentioned him, Harry Warren, he said when he was young he had a dinky toy of a dingo, it was his favourite toy. I didn't, I haven't, I haven't found a dinky toy of a dingo, but this is one of those, um, this one's called a Corgi Junior, Junior. so that's um, for, and as we mentioned the other day, running around. Um, what's the difference, Harry Warren, between having a favourite toy as a youngster and having a favourite toy now? Have you still got that dinky toy? There's all those people collecting dinky toys, but you can still get a dinky toy dingo without too much money. Is that one of those things that now's the time in your life where you need another dinky toy um, so you can play around with it or have it as the, um, I don't know, what is it, like a stress reliever, you know, like I was saying about driving over the bread clothes and everything. But um, anyway, um, it is funny how certain toys sort of stick in the mind um, and uh, remain with us all that time. And of course, being big boys, we're only just really sort of like kids slightly older, aren't we? So we still like playing with those toys, which brings me on to some of the things that we have here for you. So um, if you're not interested in buying us anything, now's the time to switch off. Or you might be interested because there's one or two of the things we've got here. Things we don't normally, there we are, we've got ships. That's one of these, a massive great, great halfway. There's one of these Kobe block built um, ships. So what you've got there, USS Iowa. So if you're interested in that, I mentioned it a little bit earlier on, our Stuart tank we've got here. Um, again, big heavy kit here we've got, 116 scale. Um, photo etched metal parks as well and everything else. So there's some, um, you know, right across the range. We've got, uh, again, look on the website for the other kits there. If you're uh, served in a warrior, like warriors, um, there's one there with all its added bar armour. T-shirt down the front, lots of different T-shirts you can see on the site. So if you go back to... You play your cards, um, 
tank museum ones of different tanks, different periods in, on the back of each one there sort of thing. So that's um, tank museum set of playing cards. Rock, so you can always add that to the thing, which is, um, I think I explained last time, I'm, I'm not sure if every country has its own version of rock, but there we are, it has a name through the suite at the end. Still selling well, and I believe we've got new, newer patterns coming as well, but there's our tank museum socks, new colours. If you like your tigers, there's our hanging wall sign for the, uh, or from the tiger collection, as it was done. I've mentioned, uh, I've mentioned about the flask, haven't I? Other books we've got going, I've mentioned it before, um, Max Hastings, how the Germans come up from the south in Das Reich to join the battle in Normandy and the issues they have on the way um, and what that leads to, which I was um, not giving the game away too much sort of thing, but it's worth definitely worth a read, $3.99. Um, I know a lot of you out there, if you like your um, off-road vehicles or military vehicles, Military Land Rover, another one of those Haynes manuals, um, Cracking illustrations, as those of you, are, you know, we've said before about the Haynes ones, and luckily lots of you come back and agreed with us. Eight ninety nine, the military Land Rover one. Um, if you like your literature, if you haven't read it, you just should read Memoirs of an Infantry Officer um, by Siegfried Sassoon. So he did three volumes. Um, what is it? Memoirs of the Fox Hunting Man. I can't remember the third one. This, I was really impressed by this. This is a reprint of the original Faber and Faber publication with illustrations by Barnett Friedman, who was one of these British book illustrators, 20s and 30s, like a golden era of book illustration as well in many ways. Eric Revillius, Edward Borden, and all those guys who then became war artists like um, Barnett Friedman did. So it's, um, it's got his lovely illustrations in there. And the key thing about Sassoon is he's a great writer uh, and again, I don't want to give the game away too much, but Sassoon famously is one of those guys, he gets a military medal, he's brave as anything, he, he records it, he's, 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 the quality of his, of his writing is just staggeringly good. And uh, he's friends with Robert Graves, again, he's got his own uh, memoir as well that he writes. So, I'd, you know, that's a great First World War memoir. And of course, Sassoon gets to the point where whether, depending on how, how you look at it, he's encouraged to or led astray or whatever, he gets to the point where he says this is just wrong, this war is being continued by people for the wrong reasons, he believes, and writes to the paper and supposedly throws his medals in the River Thames, etc., and um, disagrees with what's going on and then gets sent to Craig Lockhart where he's with Wilfred Owen and certain other people he meets. He's writing poetry as well at the time, but ultimately is Again, am I giving the game away? He goes back and fights because he realises he'd much be better off at the front with his men than um, um, doing what he was doing back on the, uh, at home, as it were. But a really, really great read. So $4.99 um, and a really nice reprint one, as I was saying, so with Barnett Friedman there. I've mentioned it a number of times before, Troop Leader, Tank Commander story, Bill Bellamy. And if you do read it, um, those of you, thank you again, those of you who have been making comments about it, really worth coming and then visiting because we've got some Bill Bellamy items including the famous Audrey that you'll read about in there is now on display. Another one of our cheap ones, 3 dollars Wings on My Sleeve. Now those of you who like your air stuff you've heard of Eric Winkle Brown, an amazing character, only died a couple of years ago. Um, uh, you know, flew everything, could speak German, um, interviewed the uh, German Luftwaffe high command at the end of the war, flew, captured planes. I think he's down as having the most carrier landing there, are record breaking 2,407 aircraft carrier landing. Some American pilot tried to beat him some years ago and gave up. Um, but um, yeah, a fantastic story. And like it says actually on the blurb, it does make you laugh. When you read through his life story, it makes James Bond seem a bit of a slacker. Um, but definitely one worth reading there. Um, Hobart's Funnies, 79th Armoured Division at War, Invention, Innovation, Inspiration by Richard Doherty. So Richard Doherty, a great writer on armour, lives out in Northern Ireland. Um, again, I, I, you know, if you're a 79th Armoured Division person, want to know about specialised armour anyway, that's definitely one that's worth picking up on. And I mentioned the other week we'd got hold of that um, History of the German 507th, another really beautifully put together book, um, and it's a translation of um, the memoirs of um, von Rosen, who's one of those Panzer commanders, very heavily illustrated with all his personal photos, etc. He's the one that's fighting in Normandy as well and ends up um, with those King Tigers. You remember that, that, that German propaganda footage of all the unit 
driving off with his King Tigers over this Heathland. Um, that's one Rosen in the turret there, that's his unit there. So uh, again, if you like your German tank stuff, that's another one of those memoirs, how it was from a significant figure in the story as well. And um, yeah, that's £12.99, so it's a pretty good saving I think you've got on that from the original, there we are, £25 published price, so we've been able to get hold of that one. Um, other models, what was the other models I've got down here? So, oh, that was it, Berlin Camo, very popular flavour of the month at the moment again, because we've painted some Challenger 2s in the British Army back in Berlin Camo. Um, so there you've got a Chieftain. We have, and I was trying to hide it so it didn't melt in this sunshine we've got here today. Tank Museum, Tiger Day chocolate or Sherman chocolate. So, um, you know, just to those of you with a sweet tooth, uh, Finn toy still going, and we've got the plushies, I believe, on the website as well, the toys, a longer one. Our inflatable shells still going strong. So again, have a look at those ones there. And I think I've covered pretty much everything. And I know a number of you, it's been a bit hot today, so it's not been running around quite so much wanted to see some footage of Finn actually instead of me just throwing the ball seeing Finn recovering ball so we'll tap something on at the end so I hope that's answered a number of the questions I hope you're enticed to go and have a look on the uh, website have a look at the tank museum shop and see if there's something you can buy thank you if you've already done that don't worry if you can't afford to buy anything we'll try and keep these going as I keep saying we'll be keeping the question and answers going for a fair bit they're, they're doing us a favor as it were at the tank museum um, but look at those other ways you can support the museum someone came in and said look if you do end up going to Amazon why would you go with Amazon when we've got our wonderful shop but if you do end up there there's you can actually give a percentage to a charity when it prompts you so the tank museum is one of those charities you can give that uh, little percentage to We've got other schemes you can join, you know, get our track link, become a sort of friend of the Tank Museum, as it were, um, join Patreon. And someone was sort of asking the other day, why don't we get notified? You've got to subscribe. If you want to watch these YouTube things regularly, subscribe to it. You know what you're doing if you know about that, or if not, I'll get someone to help you. And then you'll get notified about our YouTube content. So um, that's another way to make sure you've got that so that you'll um, constantly get to see all these things when, we, when we're putting them out. And um, otherwise, I'll um, have a good time. I'll see you next time and um, try and get out in this very, very warm sunshine. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Go on, wait. 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 Go on, then. In these difficult times, obviously your support is really valued. So please do keep following us on social media, do subscribe to our channel. And, and if you've got the opportunity, perhaps order something from our shop, uh, join one of our schemes like Patreon or our friends organization, and we'll try and keep going with giving you some content to keep you informed and entertained.